Today on Mysterion, Wes and I are not going to yell at each other. But John might. <laughs> <laughs> two friends, two pastors, two theologians, pursuing spiritual life by exploring the scriptures in conversation with the fathers. I'm Dr. Wes Arblaster. And I'm Dr. Ethan Smith. And we are Mysterion. Hey everybody, welcome back to Mysterion. We are going to jump right into things today because producer John says we are incapable of doing anything clever. Yeah, we're talking about we're going to be talking about death today, right? Mm-hmm. Let's talk about death, baby. I don't know. See what I mean? <laughs> it's pretty bad, right? <laughs> just helped out John's case right there. <laughs> this is going to end up on a bloopers reel. Yeah, you know what weird. I mean? Yeah. Anyway, actually, Freud I think would approve that song with those words. Oh, but mo- that's another yeah, story. Most, most definitely, most definitely. We're talking about death. We're actually talking to trace Trinity today into death. I mean, mm. that's drama, man. I mean, think about that, right? The eternal life of God entering into death. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a big deal. <laughs> am I am I amping it up enough here for you? I don't know. You're the hype man. You're the flavor flavor of this. I outfit. am the flavor. I just need the big clock. You, you know do. Big I, clock, yeah. Does that make me Chuck D? Yeah, I think I so. can take that. You can take that. I'm all right with that. All right, enough with the 80s stuff. Let's get into it, brother. What do you say? Let's do it. So, the last two weeks we talked about the cross in a, in a Trinitarian frame. And today we're going to talk about uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Focus a little bit more, not so much on the cross itself, but Christ's death, but also not so much on Christ's death and resurrection as a past event but a present power. Yeah, I mean, we're tracing Trinity through the life of Jesus, and we did spend some time on the cross, and from Jesus, we've said before, he enters into death, and take, and in that, and somehow, we are going to experience God's life in and through his death. What the heck does that mean, right? Big time. Like, that's a big question, right? That is a big question. And well, I think for most of us, most of the time, we're just like, oh, I don't know, when I die, mm-hmm. I'll go to heaven, or something along those lines, which is not wrong. Um, But, um, you know, scripturally, I think we'll find uh, Christ dying and rising intersects with our life uh, and the whole life of the Trinity intersecting with my death and my dying. It's not just something on my last day. It's something that, uh, you know, can happen any day, any time. That's always. important to talk about because I think one of the things is when we start talking about things like death, for example, um, we can talk about it in 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 in. Um, looking at it theologically or talking about theologically, it's very easy to create this distance between us and death, as if death is like this thing out there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And we're going to intellectualize, you know, um, about it. We're going to reflect and contemplate about death. Um, But uh, we don't want to do that because um, Mm -hmm. we think that in some sense that makes the reality of death um, false in relationship to our life, right? Mm -hmm. Death is something that, um, isn't um, an abstract problem. It's a present reality. Like one of the examples we might use is like, you know, we could talk about, you know, toothaches and how to solve a toothache um, in the abstract. It's very different when I'm actually experiencing a toothache. How do I deal with this pain? How mm-hmm. do I deal with this problem? It's an immediate reality. Mm-hmm. And I think that. Um, you know, true to what we've been saying about Trinity as um, not an intellectual um, question, um, but it's something true to life. It's something that we enter into and experience is personally, experientially. Um, we're going to find the same thing is true um, when we talk about God's relationship to our own dying. Right? Well, I think, you know, before the show, you misremembered a quote from C.S. Lewis, and the misremembering was quite relevant, even if he never wrote it. Yeah, it's all right. Go ahead. Uh, you know, you, you said you seem to remember him when he wrote the book, The Problem of Pain. Uh, there's a funny story about that book involving a very smart philosopher beating him in a debate, but that's a story for another day. Anyway, you misremembered him saying, you know, something like, you know, I can't write this book about pain and suffering because I have this toothache. Right. right? And, uh, you know, at some point he's writing the book about pain and suffering as he's enduring this awful pain and suffering in his mouth. It's getting in his way. And one of the things we're going to see, we're going to end up in Romans 7 and 8, but we're not, that's not where we're going to start. But you might want to hold that because we're going to be looking kind of close at some of the passages there. Um, that the Apostle Paul talks about death and life, dying and rising, kind of like if C.S. Lewis had that toothache while writing a book on pain. Mm. 
right? He talks about salvation through the death and resurrection of Christ as he's experiencing that as a present reality. Right. And it's a very different way of approaching the question of death, the question of death. And what does Jesus, um, what does Jesus accomplish in his own death? And how does he meet us in our death, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very different question viewed from the perspective, what we're going to see Paul's perspective where he's undergoing this, Mm -hmm. um, rather than just some sort of like, uh, you know, theoretical problem. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to dive into this thing, and I think it'll be eye-opening for us to see how Trinity encounters us. in in Eye-opening and eye-popping. Eye-popping. I found out today your eye is part of your brain. Hmm. Fun fact. Fun fact. It's not something attached to your brain. It's part of your brain. (laughs) So we teach empirical facts on Mysterion every so often. There we go. There you go. Take it home. Hmm. All right. Let's dive in. We're going to start in Matthew, right? The Gospel of Matthew in a weird passage in Matthew. People are puzzled over this for a long, long time. And today we solve it. It's all clear. Fundamentally solved. I'm going to go ahead and read this because last week you volunteered to read a passage and it didn't go so well. Round two went all right, brother. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> no yelling. All right. Matthew 27, 50 through 52. And this is at Christ's crucifixion. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Super interesting passage. So the reason why we pick up on this is because this is where we left off. We left off with the crucifixion of Christ, right? So right here, this is the moment in which Christ's um, crucifixion actually comes to its terminus, right? Mm -hmm. He dies. Um, He cries out with a loud voice. And um, um, this translation says, um, yielded up his spirit, but it's actually yielded up the spirit, which might become relevant later on. Um, And then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, when we first look at this, it could look just like a catalog of events, like a journalist is sort of writing down dramatic events that are happening. But what we want to highlight is the fact that all these things are connected. Mm -hmm. The fact that he cries out, he yields his spirit, and then immediately there's a reason why Matthew follows that specifically with the description of the veil being torn in the temple Mm -hmm. and then following that Mm -hmm. the earth shaking and tombs uh, being opened and the dead rising so say a word so uh, all of the gospels but especially the gospel of Matthew tells the story of Jesus as the conquest of the dominion of death by the kingdom of God right and in this frame of mind we've talked about this a fair amount so I'm going to do some summarizing The ancient temple that was standing when Christ walked the earth was a scale model of the kingdom of God, uh, a, a microcosm, and also a microcosm, a small version of creation as it should be. Right. So there were no dead things in the temple. Well, we often, you know, we, you know, on that sort of ladder view we've discussed these last few weeks, where God has this kind of scary holiness where He can't be around sin- sinners. The fact that the temple was a place where if you touched a dead body, you couldn't go in, or if you have a withered hand, you couldn't serve there, or if you were blind, you couldn't serve there, or women couldn't approach at certain times uh, in their cycle. It was thought that God's just so holy, he can't have those things in that place. But I think historically and scripturally, it's more true to say that because the temple was supposed to be the creation as kingdom of God, but it wasn't really it. It's a scale model. You had to do things like keep those things out so it could represent creation as it should be, unmarred by death and by sin. So it's the place where the kingdom of death hadn't taken over. And um, what you have in the, the Gospels, it's very much Christ playing the role of the glory of God seated on the mercy seat. And it's if he got out and walked out of the Holy Holies of Holies and started walking through the dominion of death. And all of those things that spoke of death, like withered hands and blind eyes and issues of blood and dead bodies, every one of those things that he touches gets healed. And all of a sudden, everybody is in the kingdom because they're with Christ, and the deathly things tend to fall away, right? It's creation as it should be. To be in his presence is to be in the presence of kingdom, of true temple. And then the story has this shock ending where he doesn't just touch 
deathly things like blind eyes or dead bodies when he raises the dead. He actually dies and he, God himself, the one seated on the throne in the kingdom of God, enters into the heart of the kingdom of death by dying and immediately it's like death blows up and gives up the dead. Right? So the fact that the sequence of events, Christ cries out his last breath, yields, or actually the word can also be translated as sends mm-hmm. the spirit. The, the, the veil uh, separating the holy, the holy place, the place that's pure, where there's no death or sin or evil, mm-hmm. that the veil ripping from top to bottom is like the spirit being sent out mm-hmm. from, the, from the place of God, God's kingdom, place of life, mm-hmm. place of um, perfection, of incorruption, of eternity, and goes out into all of the brokenness and into the extreme, the most extreme far reaches of that, Mm -hmm. which is actually the dead themselves, Mm -hmm. and causes that um, um, dominion to be undone, right? Yes. And so in that that sense, to use the, the, the ancient language, right, Christ tramples down death by death, and upon those who are in the tombs begins to bestow life. Mm-hmm. So that sequence of events is the kind of description that we have here. Now, I think what we want to talk about, because we just want to open with this image, mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. what we want to say about it is many of us can like nod our heads and say, yes, I believe that. I see things that way. And yet we see ourselves as a re- at a remove from mm-hmm. it, right? Um, we see Christ entering the place of the dead as, I don't know, maybe a mythological place or a mm-hmm. real place like hell or Hades or whatever it may I be. I told you about those Russian scientists who dug I into know. the earth really deep and they heard screaming. Yep. Yep. That's hell. So, yeah. It's, so, it's real. Well, you know, I have a lot of science today, folks. A lot of science. <laughs> I wouldn't trust this guy <laughs> at all. But my point is this. My point is this. Is that um, when we look at those things, we see those things at a, at a distance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but what we want to talk about today is the way that um, you know Saint Paul understands this is when Christ goes into the land of the dead and touches the dead and brings the dead back to life. Um, he's including himself in that. Mm-hmm. So the dominion of death is one that's not just. Um, the limits of that aren't just the corpses, those who have passed on, mm-hmm. but it includes even those of us who are alive today. Yeah. So I mean, go ahead. I think we're going to see what Paul has to say is uh, a couple of things, right? Um, that's not, so it's not Christ descending into death and destroying it by death. Christ invading the kingdom of death with the spirit of life, right? The spirit that was breathed into the nostrils of Adam at the beginning. He goes into the place of death and breathes that forth. One, that's not just a past event. And two, that is something that can and does happen in us. We are carriers of this thing called death. Death is a state of being. It's not a place. And Christ enters into the, the death of humanity, the death of Wes, the death of Ethan, even that of producer John though he's been mean to us today, <laughs> right? And there he breathes forth the spirit of life, the giver of life. Yeah, so what we're going to find right? is it's actually in our wrestling with death, the dominion of death, and the experience that we have in uh, following the way of Christ out of that, mm-hmm. that we trace Trinity. So the life of the Trinity is manifest in our struggling with death. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the manner in which we are freed from that. Um, and that's a reality today. It's a reality that we can trace um, in the now, mm-hmm. um, in me, in you, um, if we follow the lead of St. Paul in this. So. Yes. So, like I said, we'll be looking at, we're going to look at a few passages in chapter 7 and 8 of Romans. But I think if you follow along or if you want to go back and read it afterward, you'll see that what we're saying really makes sense of a lot of maybe confusing passages otherwise. And this, this story of Christ invading death with his own death and bringing forth life, you're going to see that playing out uh, in everyday life here, right? So chapter 7, Paul has this pretty famous line we're going to talk about, Romans seven twenty four. 
Yeah, and we want to say, if you got a moment and you want to just sit with us for a while, you can open your Bibles and read Romans 7 and 8. You'll get a fuller picture. that This 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 um, particular um, part of Paul's letter to the Romans is so dense um, that um, we're only going to be able to pull out a verse here and a verse there due to time constraints. Mm-hmm. But we hope that you might go back and look at it all and see all the connections that hopefully at least we can paraphrase. Yeah, Paul's language is so dense that if we unpacked it all, it would take us forever and be super technical. So we're going to do kind of an overview of these chapters, but I think if you go back in with the lens we're providing, you'll see. Yeah, so, so why are we starting Why are we starting in 724? 724. I mean, this is kind of a cusp, cusp because um, of... Um, uh, the relationship between what he's talking about before and mm-hmm, after, mm-hmm. because before he's talking about this kind of war that's happening inside of him, right? Mm-hmm. He talks about um, the inward man striving to glorify God, right? And the things of God. But he says, right along with me is there's this law of sin or this dominion of mm-hmm. sin. Law there is not just um, a written code, but the force or the dominion right. of sin. Um, that is at work in his and the word he uses is members. It's in the parts of my body. Um, and so he finds himself at odds with himself. So there's a striving towards God, which is uh, life and peace. Um, and yet at the same time, he's crippled. He's afflicted um, mm-hmm. by the dominion of sin and <clears throat> death. Um, and so he sums it up in this one sort of phrase. Yeah, yeah. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free free from the body of this death? Now, just just to reiterate, so he he sees himself as having a a a, a body of death that, as you said, has him afflicted and enslaved and at war with both God and with himself. And as you said so well, I just want to come back over to to, to name this. So clearly he thinks of death here as more than just the cessation of physical life, but rather it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a life lived uh, entirely in accord with the needs and the pleasures and the pains of a body that dies. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or another word he asked for it usually is, is the Greek word is sarx, uh, which is better translated flesh. If you're reading it in IV, it says human nature. That is a terrible translation of that word, just saying. Um, NIV is good in other places, but in this particular place, it's bad. But for Paul, the body of death, death itself, being in the dominion of death under the law of sin is to have this tortured inability to do the things you know are right, that are in accordance with the will of God, and also this inability to sort of make, you know, be in alignment with yourself. If you want to serve and please God, you can't. So you're you kind of askew from God and from yourself. And then your inner person, your your noose, he actually uses the language of the mind or the noose in this, which is created to dwell on the eternal spirit, is entirely caught up in paying attention to the stuff, not only of a body, but of a body corrupted by mm-hmm. sin and death, right? Because bodies as such are good, but this is the body of death. Yeah, just to give evidence for that really quick, um, you know, con- to convince everybody. Um, first of all, wretched man that I am, or wretch that I am, you know, I think we've been influenced by later Christian uh, theology on this to, you know, like, for example, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Mm-hmm. We think wretch just means a bad person. But here it means a person uh, who is afflicted. It's a suffering person. So he's basically saying, oh, I am a man that suffers or undergoes a burden or affliction. Or we might say condition, right? A sickness, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think we need to bring that word back, wretch. Yeah, I you like, like that. It's a good it word. Good. It is good. Wretch. It is. It's I get nice. the thumbs up from John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. John likes it. So Maybe we'll work anyway. that into a cold open. <laughs> Calling each other wretches. <laughs> we'll do it. Yes. The, uh, the, this wretched condition, this, this affliction, um, is the affliction of a body of death. And it's literally... He's talking about the members of his body that die. Mm-hmm. So the point here is, my, my point is this, is that death is not for Paul an abstract reality in the future. It's not some theoretical thing out there. Mm-hmm. He's talking about his own body and the the kind of struggle mm-hmm. that he has in 
relationship to the way in which he can't do what he desires to do. Mm -hmm. And he always seems to find himself stumbling because his body is afflicted in this way. The members of his body are warring against his spirit. And I think that that description, he's saying that is the condition of death. That's what it means to be in under the dominion of death. Yeah, I mean, so... uh, so Paul, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul's a good Jewish rabbi teacher. Actually, rabbi is anachronistic, but a good Jewish theologian. And <clears throat> think about it. For him, he's going to think about death in terms of Genesis 2 and 3. God says, the day you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, on that day you will surely die. Well, Adam and Eve don't drop dead that day, but they are sent out of the garden where they had this close communion with the Spirit but now they are sent into a world with bodies that die to wrestle with thistles and thorns. That is, in a sense, death, right? It's an extension of death, right? So, so Paul says, look, this is what it looks like. I mean, let's talk about what it looks like in our lives, right? Like even people who aren't particularly religious, we all know that we fail our own uh, moral principles, that we don't live up to the relationships that we, you know, we want to. We, we don't have the peace with others that we want or with ourselves. We wrestle with ourselves and with others. This afflicted, wretched kind of condition, this is the dominion of death. Yeah, I mean, one of the words we used uh, to describe it earlier today was uh, it's a living death, right? A living death. It's a living death. It's a life that is in some sense determined by death, um, <clears throat> uh, oriented towards the f- Again, avoiding death, the fear of death. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, this is his current condition. So what we're going to find here is this is the state in which Paul describes himself. Mm -hmm. um, He describes it as a condition of death. Paul may not be 100% dead, but to use the classic line from Prince's Bride, he's mostly dead, Mm -hmm. right? He's mostly dead in the sense in the sense that he um, suffers the affliction, the power, the dominion. Um, of sin, um, which is the working of death itself upon him. So he needs um, a miracle worker. He needs it. Yeah, he does need a miracle worker. That's well, right. That really played out well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't it? Wasn't it Max the miracle worker? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. The Max thing, not so much, but a miracle worker. <laughs> you know. You know. It's one of the greatest things is love. But uh, <laughs> that that's I mean that and a go. mutton lettuce and tomato sandwich, right? Mm. All right. So anyway. Okay, so Paul's got this great summary line. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on. on. Wretches that we are. Romans 8, 6. It's this great summary line we want to talk about, you know, what is death? What is resurrection life, right? And he's got this line, uh, which he writes, For the mind set on flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Yeah. Right? So, again, we've talked about this before. Uh, The we're supposed to, you know, we were created bodies, right? Created body is not bad. Uh, but bodies with the demands they have because we're dying and them putting demands on our higher faculties that should rule us because they know God, right? Uh, that's out of sorts. That's, that's death. And that brings us into conflict with ourselves and with each other and with God. And um, in contrast, he says the mindset on the spirit is life. And so Paul has this story about, one, death is not just a problem about the end of his life or the end of your life, that he, he has this body of death that he needs to be, in some sense, liberated from, although we're going to see that body is also liberated. Um, so his mind must be turned from flesh to the spirit. And he's got a story about how that happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's talk just before we go on. I think we can say a word here. Why is the mind set on flesh? Why does it lead us inevitably towards death? Mm -hmm. You know, Um, I think that this is a this is a good question because this is why, because we tend to think. Again, uh, our inherited picture tends to be you sin and then the consequence of that, your punishment for sin is death. Mm -hmm. So sin is doing what God doesn't want you to do. Mm -hmm. God's angry because you didn't do what God wanted you to do, and so he punishes you with death. That tends to be the way that we look at it. But I think that for Paul, the connection here, because he's talking about the members of our body and the dominion of the the flesh leading to death, Mm -hmm. and we're going to find even later on when he he actually starts to use the word 
um, when he's talking about death, not just the Greek word thanatos, which is sort of like death in general, but he uses necron, which is like dead bodies. Yeah, right? necrosis. Necrosis, decaying. like, right, yeah. So he's really connecting very closely this idea of the flesh um, uh, as uh, directing us towards death, as if death is the inevitable consequence mm -hmm. of this. Yeah, and it's, it's like um, in this kingdom, death is king, and 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 sin is his, his law. It's it's. We, I think sometimes the model where we get it backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Sin's the big problem. And it's just too bad that you get death. But I mean, if you read Paul's letters closely, we can't go into this, but throughout, and even in the book of Hebrews, I'd say. <clears throat> Death is very much the sort of like ruler of this dominion, and his law, his power, is is sin. Precisely because death rules, and our minds are set on his rule, that's where sin comes from, right? I mean, I mean, Hebrews talks about Satan having the power of death and holding us captive by the fear of death. That's what drives all these wild sins that we engage in and conflict with each other and with ourselves. But Anyway, yeah, yeah. I think I I if we were to explore this more, we could go back to, for example, our Hate the Eight series and talk about the way in which the passions mm -hmm. um, themselves, all of those are forms of the flesh, right? Yeah, Being turned death. toward the body. So, um, you know, if we, we just be, be, be reminded of some of those, you know, we have um, greed, we have pride, we have lust, right? We have anger. And all of these are forms of um, forms of the flesh having some sway over us um, such that we end up dying, actually literally dying <laughs> through, I mean, mm -hmm. often sometimes through our own devices, through war and violence and those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Um, but also um, it just, it's the life of the body. It, yeah, this, the, this body dies. Mm -hmm. And if that's everything to us, Right, then that's our whole the existence. inevitable terminus, the inevitable end <clears throat> is going to be death. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so we have to be liberated from this, and for wretches that we are, wretches that we are, right? We are all, Ethan, even you, mostly dead. So how are we going to uh, experience some freedom from that? We want to jump ahead to the next passage to Let's explain. Do it. All right. So Paul writes, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you right now we want to spend the reason why we have this up we had to jump to verse 11 um, is because we really want to dig into this a little bit more deep deeply but before that um, the really the way in which he talks about the change is in actually in verse 1 of chapter 8 there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus um, for those that are in uh, Christ Jesus. And then he talks about Christ coming in the likeness. I think it's, what, verse 3 or something like that. Um, he comes in the likeness of sinful flesh, mm -hmm. and he condemns sin, right, um, and empowers us through the Spirit towards life. So for, for Christ, Jesus Christ um, is going to be, of course, the one who frees us from the law of death. But what we really want to dive into today is the way in which Christ does that is he actually unites himself to us fully, not only becoming human, but becoming a corruptible <clears throat> body, right? right. Um, and suffering death in the, in the flesh mm -hmm. in that way and enters into he, Christ, in Christ, you know, we said before, right? God dies in Christ, right? Um, yeah. And in that sense, becomes entirely um, identified with us completely, all the way to the point of being not just mostly dead, but all dead, all dead. And, you know, this is a Trinitarian act, as we've stressed. Typically, when people want to talk about the Trinity in the Apostle Paul, they go to chapter eight of Romans and rightly so. But the thing that Paul does, that Paul says Christ does, is he enters into death. And of course, again, death is not a place, it's a state, it's a state of human existence or non-existence. And you and I carry that in us, right? When Christ enters death, he enters my death, he enters your death. And according to Paul, that's the very thing our mind is turned towards. Christ goes to that very place that our mind is turned towards and there, in that place, 
breathes forth the spirit of life, right? The spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is in us. And so, you know, we, we talked uh, earlier today, and I'm going to keep making these connections to Genesis 2 and 3, right? Genesis 2, where God uh, molds the dust of the earth and then brings it to life as Adam by breathing, by breathing the spirit within him, right? But now we have something even more dramatic where the creator of the world, Christ, has become dust, Mm -hmm. has become the dust of the earth. And in that dust, not just on it, in that dust breathes forth the spirit of life. And it's the very thing our minds are turned towards so it can grab our attention. Uh, It's where we're facing, where we had looked at the things of death and therefore brought death in as the whole of who we are. In, in, in that place where we are dead, where we are dust, Christ enters fully with us as dead, and the spirit of life floods that space, can grab our attention now in, in the death I carry about now, and can lead me to life, right? Right. So rather than Christ's death being just a, uh, a payment for, you know, a sin debt or something like that. For wretches. For, for wretches. What we have is Christ's death um, on the cross. He breathes out his spirit. He becomes mm-hmm. a corpse. Right. And the, the, the spirit of God, which is in him, right, mm-hmm. actually enters into, <clears throat> we might, we can use the language, the place of death, but actually in some sense touches death. Mm-hmm. Uh, the pl- that most outermost limit, the thing that is most unlike God. I mean, God is eternal life, perfect life, incorruptible, um, eternal, unlimited. Death is the opposite mm-hmm. of that. Um, we find the life of the Trinity through Christ, um, the spirit of life, the giver of life, enters into that, unites himself to all of those that are dead mm-hmm. and draws us back back into life. Now that's what we're going to start to find here in this particular passage in verse 11. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, who raised Christ from the dead, but the father raised Christ from the dead and his spirit, right? If it, if that spirit also dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. There's a couple things we really want to touch on, on here. When it says, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, again, literally, that just does not mean Christ himself, right, is mm-hmm. now alive. It's the neck, it's, it's the, the term is necron. It's the corpse. It's the place. From the deca- place of decay. It's the place of decay. Yeah, he's right? becoming dust. So Christ has become, his body is beginning, we could say, to enter into decay. It's mm-hmm. a corruptible body, right? Um, but in that very place where that where he where the spirit of God, which is which is in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, enters into that, raises not only the body of Jesus to life, but begins to raise all of those who are also in the place of the dead. Mm-hmm. And that's where we found in Matthew, for example, um, you know, we have the um, those who are dead. Some some of those who are dead begin to rise, mm-hmm. and then again, Paul is describing this in the context of his own death. Right? Yes, his own wrestling with it. Who will free me from this body of death? Right. So Paul himself lives in, we could say, in the mm-hmm. realm of the dead. He mm-hmm. is himself. You know, if you want to use the imagery, you might use the imagery of you know an empire. And they, they might, uh, the empire of, might say death. At its center, it's death itself, everybody who's dead. But there's all of us out here that might not be all dead, but we're mostly dead. Mm-hmm. We're still under the dominion of the power of death. And even now, right, we begin to experience, can experience through the Spirit, through Him, the Spirit uniting Himself to our death, mm-hmm. beginning to bring us to life, draw us back into life. So a couple of things I want to say to that. And uh, one is this, that, you know, at the end of chapter seven, when, when Paul's portraying what it is to carry this death about in our bodies, there's a point in which he even, uh, he seems to give up hope for the body, right? Because our bodies, uh, 
you know, when our, when, when our flesh is king, it's so corrupted and so corrupting. He says, who will flee me from the body of this death? Uh, free me, that is. Uh, but when he gets here, right, mortal bodies, he's talking about the body of death. God will give life even to the body of death, right? So, you know, it, it's so dramatic that he has this sense of life bound to these decaying, corrupting things, this, this stuff, um, that he almost talks about just being liberated from it. But then when he starts to talk about our hope and the death and resurrection of God, the, the entrance of the life of the Trinity into our death to bring forth life, then he talks about bringing to life the body of death, right? So there's nothing left behind, so to speak. When Christ invades the spirit of of the dead and breathes forth the spirit, he takes it all. Mm. He takes it all. And the, the other thing to say is, you know, it's precisely where in my life I, I can feel the pain points of death impinging, right? The sin, temptation, pain, suffering, the various thorns of life. It's at that place in the deepest places where I'm most dead, so to speak. Christ can be found breathing forth the Spirit. It's in those places when met with a repentance and a faith in Christ that hope can invade where there's despair, right? And, um, and it's, it's those places that can be taken captive and a life can be restored. And the body itself can be reordered to the inner person who gazes upon the Spirit of life. And instead, it's almost like what you, what you focus on and it, it, its power will overrun you. If the inner person is focused on the body of death, that death overruns you, your personality, your character. But if the inner person is turned towards the spirit of life, mm-hmm. where Christ is breathing it forth in your death, it's like that overruns even the dying of the body of death, you know? Yeah, so, you know, we, we, we need to say here that this is what, what Paul is describing is not an abstract theory but he's describing his own experience, mm, right? right. Um, and we would call it probably, um, most definitely, actually, it's an ascetic experience, right? Because what he finds himself struggling with is the dominion of sin and death in his own daily life, mm-hmm. in his mm-hmm. own, we might say, passions, right? Right, exactly. Um and um, what he sees that is given to free us from this death is the Spirit of God, which calls us toward life and peace. Mm-hmm. Right? And so that uh, it might be good to talk a little bit more about what that war looks like. You know what I mean? What that, I will say, um, that struggle between the Spirit of God living according to the Spirit, or he'll Mm -hmm. use the word walking in the Spirit. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit rather than walk in the flesh? Mm -hmm. What does that mean for him? Um, I think that's one of the the important questions. I think it really starts to fill out when he says, for example, um, you know, in, in Galatians, for example, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self control. All of these things are the way in which his very life has to be oriented by the Spirit out yes. of death. Right. These are the ways to move, we would say, to walk. You know, if we want to use the imagery of Christ going into the grave and you and I are there, are in that dominion of death, mm-hmm. and Christ grabs us and says, Come out with me, right? Mm-hmm. Come mm-hmm. into life. What's that path that's going to lead us out? Yeah. Well, well the fruit that. of the Spirit is resurrection. That's, that's yes. resurrection life. That's the life of the Trinity in us. It's interesting to me that you went to Galatians for a couple of reasons because, you know, it's also in Galatians where we have, uh, you know, the idea of crucifying the flesh with its passions and desires, mm-hmm. right? This is why things like fasting can be helpful, right? Not that that saves you in itself, but to exercise a level of control over even physical appetite in order to devote yourself to the life of the spirit 
right? Now it's all by grace. You know, you can do all those fasting and those exercises in such a way that it's of no benefit to you other than pride. Um, but it is interesting that that's the same letter where he talks about that. Also the same letter where he says, I no longer live, but the son of God lives in me. Christ lives in me. Right. right. And what that looks like is the fruit of the spirit. And yeah. putting to death things like anger, impatience, wrath, and so forth. Right? So, for example, what you know, what are what are the ways in which we have exercised um, our freedom in Christ by obeying the Spirit rather than the flesh? You know, mm-hmm. I, someone that I know s- spoke about the discipline of just waking up in the morning for prayer when they're tired mm-hmm. has helped them control their anger because what they've begun to do is recognize that they are not a slave to their flesh right Mm. and even those little victories like I'm going to get up and pray dedicate time in prayer rather than sleep to the last minute Mm -hmm. gives them the kind of that walking in the spirit you might say gives them um, uh, uh, wisdom strength um, trust, faith, so when they're having an argument with their spouse, they can hold their tongue. Mm. You know, they they're not going to say things that they would want to say that before they would have mm-hmm. because they were ruled by their members, which are bound for death. Right. So those are the kinds of things. They're very, again, we're just using very small, mundane mm-hmm. things. That's right. That's actually the way in which yes. resurrection life penetrates our our mostly dead existence. Well, and right? isn't that interesting? <laughs> this is the place where, where that person's mostly dead, his angry words with his wife. But with this, that becomes the very place where resurrection life then gets touched. Christ descends into that deepest death within this person of that anger. And that becomes the very place with this little practice. Right. The spirit brings forth resurrection life, the life of the Trinity in that one. I mean, we, we could go on and on. It, it's so interesting that there's all these ways where we can talk about, you know, there's death itself and Christ invades it at the cross. But there's all these small ways where it's the very things that make us stumble that when we turn to the Lord are the very places that actually become where we put our focus to turn our mind towards the Spirit. And mm-hmm. it's those become the beachhead, so to speak, of Christ invading the kingdom, the empire of death, mm-hmm. and reversing the, its law that is sin with righteousness, with the fruit of the Spirit, and so forth. So let me ask you this real quick before we go on. You know, here he says, if the Spirit um, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will give life. He also will give life to your mortal bodies. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of us say, oh, we got this. We have, I have the Spirit of Christ in me. I, you know, I've been baptized. I invited him into my life, et cetera, et cetera. The Spirit of Christ dwells in me. Um, but that conquering, we don't have much familiarity with that, being moved from the dominion of death to the dominion of life. What's the disjunct between that? You get what I'm trying to say? No, wretch that I am, I don't understand. Wretch that you are, you don't I'm understand. I'm bringing it back. I'm saying I, I think that for some reason so many of us, even though we claim that our, we have the Spirit of God within us, we find that the dominion of sin, death, and the devil still seems to have so much sway. Mm. You know what I'm trying to say there? It seems to me like Paul's saying, this is going to happen because the Spirit is in you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, But many folks I know, most of their experience they're going to say is with frustration. They feel like they're still in that place. You know what I mean? They're still Mm -hmm. in that land of death. They're still mostly dead. Um, and I, I guess one of the things I would say to that anyway, I don't want to just put you on the spot, but this, this, we tend to think of resurrection moving from death to life as a one-time event, mm. right? I was saved, mm-hmm. you know, and therefore I went from death to life. Um, it seems to me like Paul's understanding of what this is, and Scripture's understanding of what this is, is something much uh, fuller. You know, when he says, for example, work, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it's a sense in which we're on that journey out 
mm-hmm. from death, out from our grave, out from the dominion of death. But it, it's a journey with all of its ups and downs. You you understand what I'm trying to say there? It's yeah. Well, the other thing I would say is um, it, it, to me, like these victories tend to invade the weak points. And it's, it's death and resurrection. It's it's life and death. You know, yeah, I'm, my mind always goes to Second Corinthians, and the power of Christ being known, and our weakness, and our dying, and the thorns in the flesh. But you know, I there the the place I have most experienced a joy that can't be conquered even by grief is at funerals. Mm. And I've lost a number of people very dear to me, and. Um, and at the funerals, I grieve. And that time, I grieve. But uh, the weird thing is, it's it's typically on those days where I'm most in touch with this joy, I know that that grief can't destroy. Mm. And it, it's, I mean, that's, that's life invading death. Mm. That's Christ diving into our death and bringing forth life. Mm. Uh, I, I've said it before, I think theological words make the most sense at funerals. Um, truly. Now, if we could see truthfully how, you know, my indulgences through the day where I'm not as open to another person or whatever is actually death. Um, if I, the paradox is I think if I could be aware of that as something worth grieving over, that would also put me in touch with this joyous life, right? Because it comes together. Hmm. The body of this death has to die. That's its own way into life, right? That's, uh, so I, I think there's the thing you're saying where it's those, these little things you do. Yes, right? It's not the big victories. It's these little steps you do, building little habits. But then I also think it's those places where it, it is clearly death in your life. And yet because, you know, there's faith or what have you around you, that you, it, it will sometimes put you in touch with this deeper hope, this deeper joy, this deeper peace. If, if we we could come to a place and see... Uh, it's really paradoxical, right? There are things worth grieving in me more than just those days. If I took that seriously in prayer, that would probably put me more in touch with life. Mm. You know, Mm -hmm. death leads to life. That's the way. Running away from death leads to death, right? But it's like an ignorant death. I don't even know, right? You pick up your cross and follow. Don't let it just drag behind. I, I think some of those are the to me the things I would say we have to learn I'm going to say this like we have to learn it, to brother. get a right relationship to our suffering everything hinges on finding a right relationship to our suffering I'm, I'm convinced of this and that's how we taste life that's how we come in touch with the, the, the spirit of life being breathed in us in our dying so we could say this you know we tend to think I mean it's almost as if Everything has been turned upside down by the life of the Trinity being revealed in death. Because mm-hmm. death was always something that was not God. If there's anything that's not God, it's death, mm-hmm. right? Um, that's the opposite. But now we meet Christ in our dying, and he meets us in his dying. Mm-hmm. And suddenly what we find is it's in our dying that we find him, Mm -hmm. right? So there's, now it's, (laughs) it's it's a wonderful thing because it's sort of like. It's the one thing we're all gonna accomplish. It's, yes, (laughs) yes, it is the one, we would say it is, it's the one thing that before Jesus Christ, we might say God's not there Mm -hmm. and now he is. Mm And it's the one thing that we all get to do, <laughs> no matter how. I'm not going to fail at that one. <laughs> We're all I didn't get make that it to one. the NBA, but I'm right. going to pull this one off. Right? So, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, we fight it, we fight it, we fight it. But, you know, well, we talked about this before. Like, I, we, I want to have a whole season on death because we need a lot of work on this. Like, yeah. we... Our our perspective on this is so wow. backwards. Wow. And Wes, were you ever in a kind of a gothic band? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you know, believe it or not, I don't want to tout my own horn or anything here, but my band was awesome. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, Bicycle grindstone. 
there are some of these, and we're going to get into it, but there are some of these ancient practices as it relates to our own dying and awareness of our own dying. And as much as sort of, of a sort of failing attempt I've made to embrace some of those things, it has literally freed me from so much mm-hmm. anxiety and fear and so much of a, a burden in my life because um, I've become to realize that even death... Um, I don't know how to say it. Um, I, I think we've said this before. Christ, death becomes the way in which Christ not only meets me, but finds me and embraces me. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I don't know. It, 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 is a, it is a remarkable transition. And I yeah. don't think it's that far removed from what Paul is saying here. No, not, not in the not least. I don't think. You know, Maximus has the great line, Christ gave death a new use. Uh, you know, Christ gave death a new use. And the other thing I want to say is, you know, a theoretical mindset would be like, but why do we all have to die? It's like, well, I don't have a great answer for you on that. But I do know this is our plight, so isn't this good news? If you start with what's actual, mm-hmm. then this is great news. It's the mm-hmm. only good news possible, mm-hmm. I would say. But but let's let's move on. All, all right, right. We can all come right. back. We can we, we can just, do wanna, your season wanna, of goth. I want to talk want. about it, man. So we've got a quote from Cyril of Alexandria. Yeah. One Cyril. Great Christological heroes. Yeah. yeah. Kind of a punk at times, yeah. but, you know. Yeah. He made some mistakes in his life. That's all right. All right. Here we go. So um, I'll read it. Wretch that you are. Read Wretch that I am. How did the sun restore him? He's talking specifically about Adam um, here. Um, but by all of us, we're talking about Adam as in the human race. By the death of his own flesh, he slew death. That's destroying death by death. And brought the race of man back again into incorruption. For Christ rose again for us. In order then that we might learn that he it was who at the beginning created our nature and sealed us with the Holy Spirit, our Savior again grants the Spirit through the outward sign of his breath to the holy disciples as being the first fruits of renewed nature. Hmm. It's a great line. Uh, Cyril's a great theologian. Um, one of the things I truly love about this image, I mean, there's the, you know, he, by his death in his own flesh, he slew death. That's great. We've been talking about that. But I like his focus on the Holy Spirit here. And the image of Christ is the one who, who breathed the Holy Spirit into Adam at the beginning to bring him to life. And then he goes to this, you know, the Gospel of John, where Christ is resurrected, and he breathes on the disciples, which for a long time, I was always like, that's, that's weird. Is that just some ancient custom to like breathe? But no, right? Christ is the creator. And when he, he brought us to life from the dust of the earth, he breathed the spirit in us. When he brings us to life from the dust of death, he breathes the spirit in us. It's a Trinitarian act. Yeah, so, so think about it this way. You know, we have um, Christ in Genesis 2 breathing on the the lifeless dust of Adam and bringing forth life. Mm-hmm. Then we have Christ on the cross breathing out his spirit mm-hmm. onto the dead, right? And then beginning to rise. Mm-hmm. Then we have him breathing out the spirit onto the apostles, giving them the Holy Spirit that way. And then Christ breathing the spirit into Paul, mm-hmm. right? so that his own life can come be resurrected. He can yeah. experience that life. And Paul now says, we are now children. We are inheritors. We are sons yes. crying, Abba, Father. Now we have the life of Jesus Christ in us through the Spirit, yeah. sharing in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. And so all of this comes together. All of this comes together. Uh, I, I said before that if you if you listen to podcasts like this or you read books, you want to find the Trinity in the Apostle Paul, you go to Romans 8, but you tend to jump deeper into the chapter than where we've been so far. You jump over all this stuff about the mind on the flesh versus the mind on the spirit. I want to jump to that place most people jump to right away now and see how all of this comes together. The idea that the mind turned to the spirit, what that looks like in everyday life, right? And it's Trinitarian and it's prayer. And... Um, and it's this, it's this imagery of breath. So let me, I want to pull this up. This is the famous passage, Romans 8, 14 through 16. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. 
For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. That's how Christ prayed. The Spirit himself testifying with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, I wanted to do a thing. I didn't do this where, you know, the word spirit in Greek here, but also in the Old Testament spirit, that word also means breath, right? And what I love about this is if you imagine Genesis 2, imagine your Adam, your humanity waking up to its very first breath. You take that first breath there and the image of that first breath, you are face to face with Christ. And you come into existence breathing in his spirit right there, right? It's his spirit and your spirit and you're a son of God. That's Genesis 2. Boom, right? But of course, there's Genesis 3, there's the rebellion, there's walking out into the world of the thorns and the thistles and the mind turned away from the breath or the spirit of God to the things of the body and dying. But here, Paul says, those of us in Christ who cry, who by his spirit cry out, Abba, Father, the breath himself testifies with our breath that we're children of God. It's like Paul paints this picture of the very breath by which we pray Abba, Father, you again, you are before the Spirit. This is the mind turned towards the Spirit, away from the flesh. You're like Adam taking that first breath, right? Where, where God's breath testifies in Adam's breath, right? He, and because he's coming from him, he's the Son of God. So the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. The breath it's himself testifies with our spirit. We're children of God. So, so for Paul, the like very breath he takes as he prays, Abba, Father, is Trinitarian, right? You got the praying as the Son by the Spirit to oh, the yeah. Father. But man, it's just like when Adam woke up from non-existence, out of the dust, before he's touched by sin and death. This is what yeah. we are awakening to in our prayers. So let's talk about that for a second, because just to because I think that's such a wonderful, powerful, and beautiful image rising you know when paul says uh, christ rose from the dead mm-hmm. and we, we and we also will rise that word paul often uses that word it's not just a um getting up but mm. it's a waking up mm. right yes awake arise right the image that i get there is you know you know the adam himself becoming awake mm-hmm. you know becoming alive right and the image of resurrection there is not just so much as sort of getting up, the dead body getting up, but the idea of waking up, arising, right, into this new life, um, being aware of what Christ is doing in you. Um, we awaken from the dead in prayer. There's a reason, yeah, there's a reason why death and sleep are almost synonymous in the ancient literature. Um, mm. They often talk about Christ as not, dead but they use the language christ is the king is asleep right mm-hmm. um but christ waken awakens right um and awakens us and we are sort of again to use the image of uh what does it mean to live in the life of the spirit as we struggle with it it's sort of like man when i wake up in the morning <laughs> you say you wake up really lucid but yeah. i have a hard time i am like squeezing my eyes and my wife will testify to this it takes me about 30 minutes just start to get clear and imagine that as an image of what it means to begin to live into a resurrection life to begin to trace the trinity the spirit waking us up to his own life mm-hmm. um what an what a what a beautiful what a beautiful image yeah and i think that's <laughs> your, your your waking experience is truer to our spiritual reality right mm-hmm. we don't just boom resurrection but we are slowly coming out of the sleep it's mm-hmm. wrestling in prayer right and that's where we are awoken. So yeah, that's mm-hmm. great. Wonderful, wonderful first person uh, image there. Um, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep tracing this. I think we're running out of time. We are running out of time, guys. We will just that we are. Though. Time is finite for us. <laughs> we'll keep talking about debt. It's, it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> oh, maybe okay, so. maybe maybe you could come in. Your old band could come in. Yeah, play some, you know some death metal. Oh yeah, yeah. I you know what? Maybe we will. All right. (laughs) Thank you for joining us. Uh, Yeah. We'll see you next week. Uh, uh, Like, subscribe, make comments, you know. Recommend. 
some money. All that stuff. We'll see you.